All right, let's go ahead and start. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, begin in this first uh, session to talk about their history, uh, because that's going to reveal a lot. And uh, obviously, we're covering from the uh, 1800s all the way to today, so it's a lot of history. So what I've done, rather than give you every single jot and tittle, I've just kind of given you maybe some summary, and I'm trying to highlight certain key things that happen to people or prophecies that they made that I believe will reveal to you what the King Jehovah Witnesses are all about. And, and again, you could there's books and books written on uh, Judge Rutherford and Charles Taze Russell and the people that were there uh, formulating this doctrine. Um, so let's, let's talk about their history. And I primarily want to look at four people uh, because they, they're really the ones, and especially one of them, really defined... Uh, so much of the theology uh, and belief system of the Jehovah Witnesses. So I want to start by going to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. And let's look at a verse there that has been the heart and soul of Jehovah Witness beliefs. Matthew 24, and I'm going to read verses 45 through 47. Matthew 24, verse 45 through 47. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant or slave whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all of his goods. <clears throat> This verse, as we cover it uh, this today and, and, and especially next week, this verse has been one of the defining verses for the Jehovah Witnesses. And the reason is it has become a defining verse is that early on, the founder, Charles Taze Russell, the Jehovah Witnesses came to believe, uh, back then again, they were not Jehovah Witnesses, they were called the Bible Study Movement, uh, Bible Student Movement. The Jehovah Witnesses came to believe that Charles Taze Russell was the fulfillment of verse 45. He was the faithful and wise servant whom the Lord made ruler over his whole household to give food in due season, to teach the Bible to people. So this verse does not apply to anybody else. This verse right here is Charles Taze Russell. <laughs> That's what the Jehovah Witnesses believe. Later on, that changed. Later on, because he's dead now. So you've got to think about, it. okay, uh, this is the guy that's feeding us with food, and we're not even reading his writings anymore, and he's not even alive. So who's the new faithful and wise servant? Well, now they change it. It's the governing body over there in New York. That's the faithful and wise servant. Nobody else, no Christian, no denomination, no other individual, just the Jehovah Witnesses fulfill this. They're the only ones authorized to give people food, spiritual food in due season, and that's why God makes them the ruler over everybody. So this is very key verses for the Jehovah Witness people. All right, so let's start with some origins. Uh, and I'm just going to define this word uh, the word Advent. Okay, so with Jesus, there's, there's two Advents in the Bible, right? The first Advent was when he came here to earth as a baby in the manger, born of a virgin. That was the first Advent. The second Advent is when he comes again at the end of the age in glory and power and judgment, raptures, church, and so on. Okay, so that's what the word Advent, the Latin word means to arrive or to come. So when I say Adventist origins of Jehovah Witnesses, there were a lot of people in the 1800s that were preaching the coming of Jesus. They were preaching an eschatology. They were preaching an end-time message that turned out to be very, very wrong, okay, very much false. And so when I say Adventist origins of the Jehovah Witnesses, the Jehovah Witnesses came as an offshoot of these wrong eschatology. And if there's any group on the face of the earth that promotes eschatology, uh, like crazy, it's the Jehovah Witnesses. In fact, almost all of their, uh, later, their theology and how they believe about things, we're going to see is all based on their eschatology, what they believe about the end times. So there was a man named William Miller, 
And you may have heard that in, 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 Christ, in religious history in the, in the 1800s. He's a very well-known figure, William Miller. He was a Baptist layman. He was not a minister. He was not, didn't go to any school, didn't have any kind of special training. He was just a Baptist layman. He was a person who studied the Bible. And according to him, he studied the Bible intensely from 1816 to 1818. And he did a lot of crunching of numbers, chronology, eschatology. He kind of mixed it all up. And he came up with a, a, a conclusion that Jesus Christ was going to come in about 25 years or in 1843. And, there was a, and, and this, this was kind of like a sensational thing. And so people started following this guy, and, and he started going to, to big-name preachers in New York. And there's a whole history that you can read about it. Joshua Hines was a very well-known pastor in New York. He went to him, started giving him all of his teaching materials, and people started promoting this. So everybody was excited. Hey, Jesus is coming in 1843? What he did, what uh, William Miller did, and, and, and the movement got so big that the group of people that were following him became known as Millerites. They were following William Miller. They became known as Millerites. What he did was he took uh, the 2,300 evenings and mornings, or 2,300 days from Daniel 8, 40, 14, and he converted them into years. Okay? So uh, we're going to do some of the math here in just a little bit so you can see that. And so what he did was initially he said, okay, Jesus is coming in March of 1843. And then he corrected himself and says, no, it's going to be in March of 1844. And then when Jesus didn't come then, uh, there was another guy uh, by the last name of Snow who said, no, he's actually going to come on October 22nd of 1844. They got the math right this time. He's going to come on October 22nd of 1844. And people sold their properties, they sold their houses, they quit going to work, they just said, Jesus is coming on October 22nd, 1844, and of course, you know, it passed, and nothing happened, and that became known in religious history of the 18, 1800s as the Great Disappointment. From that disappointment, a whole bunch of people left the movement. They said, ah, you guys are crazy. Other people became known as spiritualizers. They said, oh, Jesus came in the spirit. He came invisibly. Uh, he did actually come. Uh, and then there were a whole group of people called what we know today as Seventh-day Adventists. And they, they came up with a totally different scheme based on Daniel 8, 14. And I, I, I've taught on this before in the Daniel class, and you can go online and listen to that. So with this great disappointment, all these groups split, and way more than these, but these are some of the main ones. One was called the Advent Christian Church. They had a certain belief about Jesus coming. Another one was called Life and Advent Union. We're going to talk about the guy that, that led that. There was another group that we know today as the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, and by the way, the, the whole eschatology of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is so corrupt and so confused. Uh, I, don't, I can't even believe people believe it. It's just so... And you just you can go read their own history and, and look at it and say, oh my God, people actually believe this crazy thing. And I talk about it in, on, uh, on that teaching that I did in, when I did the Daniel class. And then there was a group called the Second Adventist Group. And it's from this group that the Jehovah Witness theology came and eschatology came. So there was a man named George Storrs and he became the publisher of a, of a, of a magazine and a teaching uh, material called the Bible Examiner. And he was the founder of this one of these split groups. And while he was not given to too much uh, dating of things and when Jesus was coming, his take on it was that Jesus was going to come in 1870. And George Storrs was a guy who greatly influenced uh, Charles Taze Russell. But the man that, that influenced... Uh, Charles Taze Russell the most was a guy named Nelson Barber. And he published a, a magazine called The Herald of the Morning. It was all primarily focused on eschatology. And he said, no, Jesus is coming in 1873. And later on, he corrected himself, no, he's coming in 1874. And now when Jesus didn't come in 1874, Barber did what some of these guys did back in 1844. He said, oh, actually, Jesus came invisibly. He came, you just didn't see him. Uh, and he based that on 
uh, teaching here from Matthew 24, he looked at the word coming in Greek, parousia, and he says actually it can be translated as presence, not just coming. So he said Jesus came with an invisible presence in 1874. So Barbara wrote a book. And, and by the way, I just want to tell you, I'm going to throw a lot of information, but I just want you to kind of stand back and see the, the craziness of this. If you get that, don't, don't worry about dates, times, and all that. Okay, don't, don't worry too much about that. But just kind of hear the craziness of some of these conclusions. And you can see how terrible their interpretation of Scripture is. So Barbara wrote a book called The Three Worlds in 1877. And if you look at the book, you can actually get copies of it if you want today, but if you look at the old books, it looks like Charles Taze Russell was also one of the authors, but, but Barber was the one who actually wrote the book. And he calculated that from 1874, three and a half years later, the rapture was going to take place and the gospel age was going to come to an end in 1878. Of course, that didn't happen either. Barber used this time period. He used 1,845 years as the time period from the death of Jacob to the death of Christ in A.D. 33. And then he took A.D. 33 and he added 1,845 years to come up with 1878. Okay. Doesn't that sound brilliant? <laughs> Doesn't that give you confidence that he's interpreting things correctly? Well, there was a guy named John Aquila Brown he published a book called Eventide. It was, a, it was a whole book on prophetic eschatology. It was about es eschatology in 1823 in London. And it was full of all these dates and speculations. And now, again, don't, don't worry about the, the math here. We have Pastor Rick here as our mathematician. So if you have any questions, you can talk to Pastor Rick after this, okay? But, but just don't worry about the numbers, okay? But just listen to how crazy this is, okay? So here's what... John Brown wrote in his book. He somehow concluded that the kingdom of Judah fell to Nebuchadnezzar and that began the Gentile rule over Israel in 604 B.C. Now, that, by the way, is, is incorrect, but they went ahead and took that. And then what John Brown did was he was trying to figure out all this math. He was trying to figure out numbers in the Bible and do you remember there when, when Nebuchadnezzar was turned into an, uh, like a beast, remember, and he was eating out there, the grass and all that? And remember where it says the, the watcher came seven times to him? Well, what, he, what this guy says that, oh, those seven times, I see, Nebuchadnezzar represents the whole time of the Gentiles to fulfill Luke 21, 24. So I'm going to take those seven times and I'm going to multiply it by 360 days, and actually I'm going to convert it to years, and I'm going to get 2,520 years. And if you divide 2,520 by 2, you're going to get 1,260 years. And, and you can find 1,260 days in the book of Revelation. So that's what they used. So what they did was, so, so, so John Brown took 604 B.C., and he added 2,520 years, and that, lo and behold, gave him 1917 as when Jesus was going to come. Barbara says, no, 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 Brown, you're off by a couple of years. So he redid the calculations, and he said, no, it's going to be an autumn of 1914. And later on, Barbara, when he saw that nothing was working out, he abandoned all of his math, all of his chronology, all of his eschatology, but there was a guy that was listening to Brown and barber named Charles Taze Russell. And he is the founder of what we know today as the Jehovah Witnesses. He was born in Pittsburgh in 1852 to Christian parents. And by the way, most of the people who were the heads of the, these, these leaders that I'm going to talk about today, they were all coming out of Christian churches. <laughs> At a young age, he became a skeptic of Bible truths, first denying eternal punishment. He absolutely thought that people being punished in hell forever was the, was the worst possible doctrine of all time. So he absolutely rejected that, and that led to him being a skeptic. He just didn't believe in God. But later on, he got influenced by these guys, Storrs, Barber, and another guy named George Stetson. And when he and Barber had a disagreement, uh, Barber was publishing his magazine. Well, Charles Taze Russell started publishing his, called The Zion's Watchtower, 
and the herald of Christ's presence. And this is officially the, the mark point for historians as to when the Jehovah Witness movement started. It was July 1st, 1879. That was the first published periodical that Charles Taze Russell put out. And that's where they say that's the beginning of this whole movement. I'm going to make this comment along the way here. Also in that same year, 1879, he married a lady named Maria Ackley. They divorced in 1913. It was a very scandalous divorce. And uh, she accused him of having an affair with one of the secretaries there at, at the Watchtower Society. They ended up having no children because he was always thinking Jesus is coming. <laughs> I don't want to be having children and stuff because Jesus is coming like tomorrow. You know, he's like, he's coming 1914. He's coming here. He's coming. He's always coming. And so they, he, he thought, you know what? I, I kind of need to abstain from having relations with my wife. And that was actually part of the complaint that was filed legally in court. We have the doc, people have the documents of it that she complained that he was not fulfilling his marital duties to his wife. In 1881, he organized the Zion's Watchtower Tract Society of Pennsylvania, and that's the forerunner of what became the Jehovah Witnesses. They actually became a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a government-recognized group in 1884. But this is when he started organizing all this. In 1882, he denied the doctrine of the Trinity. He said it was satanic. It was a heathen doctrine, an equivalent to the way he said it, Hinduism. It's like Hindus, all these multiple gods. He also began teaching that Jesus was a created being. That he was actually Mark, Michael the archangel in heaven, but when he came down here, he was known as Jesus. And he denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, which Paul said, if you don't believe in the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, your faith is vain and so is your preaching. He began to, to spread all these teachings, and people thought he was somebody great, and he began to organize these groups called Bible student groups. And they became known as the Bible student movement. So there was literally hundreds of people meeting all around. He would actually go and visit these places where people would gather. He would publish material and get it out to them. And people began to study all of his eschatology, all of his belief system. And it turned into a pretty big movement. Um, you can... Order this if you want. I, I like to sometimes go to original sources because that way I don't get somebody's interpretation. So I actually ordered the Watchtower, official Watchtower biography on Charles Taze Russell. I wanted to hear what the Jehovah Witnesses believe about him. I didn't want to have somebody tell me what they believed about him. So you can get this little book. Uh, it was originally published in 1916. And this is the, the Jehovah Witness version of who Charles Taze Russell is. So it gives you an understanding of how they think about their founder. And I'm just going to quote some things that they believe about him. He's the greatest man that has lived since the Apostle Paul. He was the greatest religious teacher, St. Paul, and he did more than any other man of modern times to establish the faith of the people in scriptures. And he is the only one who has been permitted to understand the Bible. That's what they believe. He's the only guy... Because, see, he's that faithful and wise servant whom God has put as ruler to give food to his people in due season. He's the only guy. Again, quoting from this, thousands of readers of his writings believed he fulfilled the office of that faithful and wise servant of Matthew 24, verses 45 through 47, who alone was given the work of giving meat in due season, and he was alone given this work to be the ruler over God's household. Some exclusive beliefs. And we teach this in our class on uh, false doctrine, uh, false uh, t teaching seminar that I do. And I'm going to do it again in March. They asked me to come back and do it again in March. But when you begin to think you're the only one, you're in a cult. Just start running as fast as you can. Get out of that building as fast as you can. If I, if I ever stand up here and I say, I'm the only guy with the truth, or I'm the only pastor you ought to listen to, and don't listen to anybody else because I'm the only one, just run out of here as fast as you can because I'll lie to you about other things too. So never, never, whenever you hear anybody say, we're the only ones, that's when you know right away you're an heir. Because there's a lot of people all over the world that love Jesus. And we're not the only ones. 
there's a lot of people who love Jesus like we love Jesus. So this is, so when I say exclusive beliefs, that's almost the very definition of uh, a cult. In fact, I didn't bring the one book, uh, Angels of Deceit. If you, if you read cult leaders, David Koresh and Jim Jones and uh, Charles Taze Russell, they're exclusive. We're the only ones. We are the ones that have the truth. Right away, you know you're in error. So they believe that Jesus and Paul preached the true gospel back in the first century. But all the creeds, writings, doctrines, and churches of Christendom, all of Christianity, since that time are false. It is only now, in the late 1800s, that God chose to reveal the true gospel again to a man named Charles Taze Russell. So they believe that Russell did not come up with a new sect or denomination or religious group. Rather, Russell has discovered the original gospel that was preached in the first century. So they can just bypass all of the Christian history and say, okay, we are the only ones that have the truth. So there was a lot of key dates, and the main date for the Jehovah Witnesses is 1914. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But in 1840, 1874, Charles Taze Russell took what Barber said as true, that Jesus Christ had come invisibly to rule on earth. 1870, uh, 1878, he also believed that the rapture had occurred to take the saints away. Of course, that didn't happen. But 1914 was the key year. And when they saw, of course, what, what was the great event that happened in 1914 in world history? World War I, world War I right? It, was, it began in 1914, ended in 19... 1918, 1914 was when World War I began. So it kind of reinforced some of the things that they were saying. The final end of the kingdoms of this world would come. In other words, this would be the end of the times of the Gentiles, and the kingdom of God would be fully established in the heavens. Russell passed away. It's a day all of us can remember. It was Halloween, October 31st of 1916. Maybe God set it up for him to pass away on Halloween, right? <laughs> Um, in, the, in the official Watchtower biography, it gives a whole section of Charles Taze Russell's will and testament. He gave instructions to the people that he had appointed as leaders on how he wanted the organization to be run when he was gone. And to be honest, it was quite honorable what he was wanting to do. He, he appointed five people. Again, you don't need to know all this detail. Just, just kind of picture this. He appointed five main people, and he formed a committee. He called it the editorial committee. And he goes, I want you five people to make all the decisions. I want you guys to be in agreement. Anything that's done for the organization has to go through you guys. If you guys agree to it, let it be done. So he had this first group of five people. And then Charles Taze Russell also had a second group of five people, and if any of these guys died or, or they didn't want to be part of it, then pick from these five guys to replenish the, the first group. Well, in this second group was a guy named Joseph Rutherford. And he happened to be an attorney, a lawyer. And it turns out that he and um, Charles Taze Russell became good friends, and he became Charles Taze Russell's personal attorney. So when Charles Taze Russell died, these guys all got together and they picked Rutherford, who was part of the second group, to be the, the new president of the organization. As it turns out, they found out right away this guy was a real authoritarian, strong-willed guy. And he began to put people out <laughs> and he began to consolidate power and it turned into a one-man rule. And he was the guy that was going to run this organization with an iron fist, and he really did. And he ended up publishing, I, it was over 20 books, 21, 24 books during the time he was the president. So he becomes the second president of the Jehovah Witnesses, named Joseph Franklin Rutherford. <clears throat> he was born in 1869. He was a trial lawyer, and he was a judge in Missouri. And... Um, we have to use judge lightly because he only served for a very, very short time. He substituted for another judge. So he wasn't really a judge, but everybody knew him as Judge Rutherford in the Jehovah Witnesses. He was baptized into the movement of the Jehovah Witnesses in 1906, and he became the legal counsel for the organization in 1907. 
He finally became president of the movement in 1917 after Russell died in, in uh, October of 1916. He became a very, came forth as a very strong-willed authoritarian leader. One of the things that Charles, uh, Judge Rutherford hated, he hated politicians. He hated all Christians. He especially despised politicians. And he was the one that began to do this whole thing against the military, don't salute the flag, uh, don't be, be involved in politics. There are no Jehovah Witnesses right now in politics. There are no politicians who are Jehovah Witnesses because that's not allowed for them to be that way. There's no Jehovah Witness in the military. They refuse to serve in the military. There's no Jehovah Witnesses that salute the flag. Uh, my wife was telling me recently that she used to have kids in her kindergarten class that their parents were Jehovah Witnesses and she could not let, make them s s say the flag salute. And uh, they couldn't even eat candy or any birthdays, celebrate birthdays or any holidays or anything. So anyway, my wife had a deal with Jehovah Witnesses there at her school. But because of his stand against politicians, against serving in the military, well, what was happening between 1914 and 1918, World War I? So they were recruiting people to go to fight in the war. Well, they said, no, we're not. We're Jehovah Witnesses. We're not going to fight in the war. You guys are the kingdoms of the devil. We're not going to join the politicians and these people. We're part of Jehovah's kingdom, not the worldly kingdoms. So the govern governments all worldwide, and including here in the United States, saw that as an act of sedition. You don't want to help us? Then you must be for the enemy. So they literally charged the whole Jehovah Witness organization, the top executives, including Judge Rutherford, with sedition and rebellion. And they were convicted in a court of law and sentenced to 20 years in prison the whole top leadership of the Jehovah Witnesses. And they literally were arrested. There's pictures of, online, you can see, where him holding his name plaque, you know, with a number. They, they went to a federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. Judge Rutherford and all these executives for the Jehovah Witnesses were sent, and they served time in a federal penitentiary for sedition because they would not serve, have their people serve in the military. Anyway, through... A year or two later, the Supreme Court got involved in it. They later on dropped the charges. And literally, literally, the Jehovah Witness movement almost completely came to a standstill. I wish it would have. It, it, it's like I, they said it almost broke the back of the Jehovah Witness because they had no leaders. You know, their leadership was gone. And again, he is God's anointed man. So he's in jail. <laughs> we can't run the organization. God's anointed man's in prison. So anyway, he got released and he came back. <clears throat> so again, they don't participate in until military service and they have suffered a lot. We'll talk about that in the next week or two. They've su uh, I think the last session we'll talk about it. They've suffered a lot because they haven't joined the military. That that's why Hitler hated the Jehovah Witnesses. He sent a lot of Jehovah Witnesses to the concentration camps because they wouldn't join the Nazi movement. <clears throat> it was in 1918 to 1920 the Judge Rutherford began the door-to-door -door proselytizing and where the Jehovah Witnesses would go out, and he demanded detailed reports of all their witnessing activities. And they took Acts 20.20, 20, where Paul said that he preached the gospel from house to house. They took that verse and said, we're going to do that. We're going to go house to house, and we're going to preach. One of the things that he did, and he greatly re, re, um, re, re, um, Felt bad, terribly. In fact, he used some very foul language to say how terrible he felt. But he predicted in 1925 that the millennium would begin, in that year, 1925. And it caused a great deal of excitement among the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, and again, they were still not known as Jehovah Witnesses, but the, the, the movement that he was leading, he told them that the millennium was coming in 1925. Everybody got excited. Nothing happened. And he said, man, I just... I'm an idiot for having said all that, but it's part of the false prophecies that Jehovah Witnesses have done. One of the things that's very strange that Judge Rutherford did was he believed that, uh, because of what he said in 1925, he believed that Abraham, David, Samuel, people like that were going to be resurrected, and they were going to come back to earth in resurrected bodies. And so they, they actually built a mansion in San Diego called Beth Sarim. Beth is the Hebrew word for home, for house. Sar is the word for prince. You add the I-M, that makes it plural. House of princes. 
So they literally built a mansion. And when they wrote out the deed, they put who were the occupants were going to be. They put Abraham, David, Samuel, all the prophets of old were going to occupy this house. And it's actually still a historical house with a marker. You can go down to San Diego and see it. Uh, it's not part of the Jehovah Witnesses. But they believed that there was these resurrected princes coming. Well, as you know, that never happened. So in order to get rid of this, they sold this property in 1948 because they saw that it was all wrong. And then when they were asked, well, how come you guys bought this place and why did you call it the House of Princes? And they go, oh, that's where Judge Rutherford went in the winter because he had a bad lung. And he did. When he was in prison, he, he, had a pro he got an infection in his lung while he was there in prison. And so he did, his doctor ordered him to go somewhere warm for the winter, so he went to San Diego. So he spent the winters in San Diego, and he stayed in this mansion. And they had all these rooms set up for Abraham, David, and all them to come back. It was in July 20, on July 26, 1931, that he decided to change the name from whatever it was before. And there was a lot of different groups that had splintered off of the Jehovah Witnesses, and he called them Jehovah's Witnesses. They go, we need to have a distinct name because he goes, there's so many splinter groups out here. It was in 1932 that he abolished elders at the local church. And now he called his movement a theocratic. Theos means God, cratic means to rule. So he says, we, me, Judge Rutherford, and our organization, we are being ruled by God. I'm God's personal representative here on the earth. And so we're being ruled now by God can't trust these elders down at the local church kingdom hall level. We're being ruled by God now. So that's when this whole theocratic government movement came with Judge Rutherford. In 1935, Rutherford believed Jesus came visibly in 1914. And so he said, hey, the church age officially ended. That's what Charles Taze Russell said. So that's why they do not call their buildings churches. They call them what? Kingdom, kingdom halls. Because we're not a church. The church age ended, ended in 1914. We are now kingdom, kingdom Halls. And I've always wondered why they don't have windows on their buildings. And there's, there's a big debate online about why that's the case. Anyway, here was the key announcement as far as theology goes with the uh, Jehovah Witnesses. was on May 31st, 1935, at a large convention in Washington, D.C., he said the 144,000 heavenly class believers had been fulfilled. It's closed. Nobody else can enter that class. They were the people from the first century. There was a lot of people there, but then all these Jehovah Witnesses. So as the Jehovah Witness movement is growing and they're seeing all these tens of thousands of people there, they're going, hey, if only 144,000 are going to heaven, what are we going to do? <laughs> Uh, there's more and more people coming in, and we're telling them that only 144,000 are going to heaven. And that's the little flock of Luke 12, 32, where Jesus said, it's my Father's pleasure to give you, the little flock, the kingdom. Those are the only ones who are truly born again. Those are the only ones who are going to rule with, with Jesus in heaven. And one of the big things about, we'll talk about this next week, one of the big things that Jehovah Witnesses believe, that we have present truth. In other words, if, if God kind of changes his mind and he wants to direct us in a different way from what we previously believed, then he can tell us something new. And now we're in present truth. We have the newest, latest truth downloaded from heaven. So what Rutherford said, he goes, hey, there's a second group that God has just revealed to me that's going to stay here on earth. The heavenly class, the 144,000, they're going to be in heaven with Jesus, but there's going to be a whole group, this great crowd of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, or the other sheep that Jesus said, there's other sheep that I must bring into the fold. That's them. Their destiny is this paradise earth on uh, paradise earth here. So there's this first class heavenly group, and there's this second class uh, great crowd. And by the way, that's so easy to defeat. You could defeat a Jehovah Witness on that in five seconds because if you read Revelation 7, 9, it says this great crowd was gathered before the throne and the Lamb of God in heaven. <laughs> so how can the great crowd be down here on earth when the very verse they're using for the great crowd says that they are before the throne and before the Lamb of God who is there in the heaven? It's like, oh my gosh, these guys are got it so wrong. Rutherford died at Beth Sarim, this mansion, on January 8, 
1942, and there was this huge legal battle that went on for months because the Jehovah Witnesses wanted to bury him right there at Beth Sarim, but San Diego had an ordinance that you could not use that property as a cemetery. <laughs> so they got into this big fight. They, they had lawyers on it and everything. Anyway, the bottom line, he ended up getting buried in New York. They couldn't bury him at Beth Sarim. And to cover up for all of the mistakes that he made, they ended up selling that uh, mansion to some private investors. But you can go there. You can actually drive up. They've, people have fixed it up. But it still has an original. It's a historical site there in San Diego. It has a plaque on it. Beth Sarim, House of the Princess. And it was part of the Jehovah Witness property. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. James Penton who said in a real sense it was he, Rutherford, rather than Russell, who developed the Jehovah Witnesses into what they are today. And if you study their theology and you study their history, Judge Rutherford had way more influence than Charles Taze Russell ever did. Um, this book, uh, Apocalypse Delayed, the story of the Jehovah Witnesses, this is the Bible that everybody references for understanding the Jehovah Witnesses. If you, wanna, if you really want to just flat out sit and study all the history of every gory detail, this guy did it. He's a, he's a retired professor of history from Canada. And it's a beautiful title, Apocalypse Delayed. It was always delayed. It was always delayed. It was always delayed. He himself was a third generation Jehovah Witness. And he came out of the, the movement. And he wrote this book. Certain sections are just incredible for, for history, but almost everybody is quoting from this book right here as far as correct history. And he had all the, you know, kind of the original sources, and he himself, having been a Jehovah Witness, he really understood the movement. So if you really, if, if you have time to study that book, about 400 pages, it's very detailed, but it really gives you all the gory detail. And man, if you, if you don't walk away going, man, the Jehovah Witnesses are confused. Uh, if you don't think that, just read that book. That will show you for sure. A couple days later, after Rutherford died, another man became president named Nathan Knorr. And he was the one that, was really, that really shaped it into a major religious force of millions. That's what Pinton's words are. So a couple days later, in 1942, he became the president. Nathan Homer Knorr. He was born in 1905. Notice again, he was raised in a Christian church. He was raised by a Christian family in a Reformed church. He was baptized as a Bible student way back in 1923. And he was the one who was going to see the worldwide expansion of Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses really took off in numbers under Nathan Knorr's leadership. He was a really, really gifted administrator. He knew how to run things and get people moving and how to organize things. And one of the key things that he did was in 1943, he began a missionary training school called Gilead School. Jehovah Witnesses know it simply as Gilead. It's in New York. It's moved to several different locations, and I think right now it's in, a, in Patterson, New York. But he started this missionary training program, and that's where they began to send Jehovah Witnesses. They were already in many, many countries of the world, but this is where now they're going to every country of the world as, as a result of this school. And it was Nathan Knorr who read some scriptures, and we'll cover those next week, who in 1945 established, again, remember, if he, he says it, if this guy says it, it's as if God has spoken it. You can't get a blood transfusion. You know, if you go to the hospital and you need a blood transfusion, they refuse to do blood transfusion even unto death. And it was in 1950 that the New World Translation was introduced. Up to that time, they had only used the King James Bible. They did not use any other translation. But then uh, they, they did the uh, New World Translation Scripture, so that's when they had their own version now of the Bible, was in 1950. I want to highlight something here again that will point out something about how the Jehovah Witnesses think. You say, why? I don't care that he was married in 1953 to some lady named Audrey. Well, when was he born? He was born in 1905. So he's almost 50 years old getting married. 
And isn't it interesting, if you look at the whole history of the Jehovah Witness leadership, Charles Taze Russell had a wife, no kids, divorced her. Judge Rutherford had one kid, but his wife, they were going to divorce, but they saw the mess that Charles Taze Russell called, so they just separated, so they lived the last 30 years of their life apart from his wife. Nathan Knorr had no kids, married late, all because Jesus is coming. You don't want to have kids. You don't want to get married. You don't want to go to college. You got to go out knocking on doors. So all these, almost all this leadership, Frederick Franz, the next guy, he never married at all. He was a bachelor his whole life. And that's so true and so typical of so many Jehovah Witnesses, the ones that really get ingrained into this. They think you need to hold off on marriage. You need to get out and knock on doors. Don't raise a family. Jehovah Witness branch offices greatly expanded under Nor's leadership. I think when he came in, he had, they had about 24, 24, 25 national offices all over the world. By the time Nor was done, there was almost 100 offices all over the world, major offices in different countries. One of the highlights of his life that he says was in 1958, they had a large convention of, of uh, Jehovah Witnesses in New York, and literally hundreds of thousands of Jehovah Witnesses descended on New York City. And it got so full that they had to turn people away, but they filled all of Yankee Stadium and the grounds, and they filled the polo grounds too, where the New York Giants were, and through simultaneous uh, speakers, they were able to preach. He was able to preach to 253,000 Jehovah Witnesses at the same time. In fact, after that, the city had some kind of ordinance against them. I forgot all the details, but they didn't want that many Jehovah Witnesses there because they were crowding everything out, you know. Um, but he preached to that many people at one time. And it kind of encouraged them a lot because you see that many Jehovah Witnesses in one place. It was a very encouraging point for them. One of the things that happened that was very bad for them was in 1975, Frederick Franz, who we're going to talk about in just, just a minute, he predicted that mankind's 6,000-year history on earth would end and Christ would begin his millennial rule on the earth. And that, all of a sudden, they, 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 they preached it for about 10 years. I think it was 64, somewhere 65. They be, Frederick Franz announced... He was, a, he was also part of the governing body. He was the vice president of the organization. And he said that the 6,000-year period for, for mankind is coming to end. Now the millennium is going to come. woo -hoo! And so the Jehovah Witnesses got really excited about this new date. And when Frederick Franz said it, as we're going to see in just a second, it was, it was as if Jesus Christ himself had said it. And, of course, that also didn't happen. In fact... It's interesting that when Frederick Franz made that announcement, Jesus is coming in 1975, all the other members of the governing board agreed with him because he was such a wise old owl. They thought, he, this, is, this is like the Apostle Paul speaking, so we've got to accept what he has to say. And they let it go through, and it turned out to be a great disaster for the Jehovah's Witnesses. So who is Frederick Franz? He's the fourth president. And then after him now, starting in 1975, uh, the governing body takes over. So we had Russell, we had Rutherford, we had Knorr, and we had Frederick Franz, but now a different type of government structure is going to form, uh, and he's going to be the last main president that runs the organization as if he's like kind of the pope of the Catholic Church. He was born in 1893. He was baptized in a Lutheran church, and he later he, wanted, he was part of a Presbyterian church. He wanted to be a Presbyterian preacher. And here's the guy that attended the University of Cincinnati, studied biblical Greek for two years, and he was self-taught in several other languages, Spanish, French, Latin, uh, Hebrew. You know, he knew enough to be dangerous in those languages, but he really didn't know the languages. But he has always been considered the main theologian of the Jehovah Witnesses. And by the way, you can hear him on YouTube speaking. And it's really fascinating because he knew Ru Charles Russell personally. He, he, he grew up with Charles Russell. He lived to be almost 100 years old. And he knew Judge Rutherford personally. He knew Nathan Knorr personally. So he shares all these. And whenever he spoke, Jehovah's Witnesses thought, man, this, the Apostle Paul is talking to us. And uh, so they really highly admired him. And so um, Raymond Franz, Frederick Franz, Franz. 
Turns out, Raymond Franz, this was his uncle. So even his nephew, Raymond, Frederick Franz, kicked him out of the Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> uh, so just, just to show, don't matter if you're family, if you don't toe the line, we're going to kick you out. Frederick Franz was a lifelong bachelor. He never married. This book is under attack right now. <laughs> the Jehovah Witnesses have never published the credentials or the names of the translators of the New World Translation Bible. But Raymond Franz said it was his uncle who was the major author of this translator. And we know his knowledge of biblical Greek and Hebrew was so limited. It was just a disaster, really, that he was the one that did the translation. But he said, my uncle was the one. We, we knew it. Within the Jehovah Witnesses governing body, we knew he was the one that did it. Uh, and again, he was greatly revered. He lived to almost be 100 years old. And he was greatly revered by all the Jehovah Witnesses as their theologian. He was the guy that really defined. In fact, he was the one that was the main writer of a lot of the published articles that you see in the Jehovah Witnesses magazine from the 1920s all the way up until he died. He was, he was the, one of the main guys that was writing all their doctrine. Okay, let's close with this th thought here. The governing body. <clears throat> Today, the Jehovah Witnesses... They do have presidents. They have vice presidents over certain ministry areas. But the way the Jehovah Witness body is, uh, leadership is structured is they have a governing body. And that's been the case since 1975. Yes, Frederick Franz was the president at that time up until his death. But suddenly now this governing body has become the supreme ruling council for the Jehovah Witnesses. They've had anywhere from 7 to 18 members. Raymond Franz in his book says that they at one time had 18 members on it, depending on deaths or new appointments. But generally, it's been around 12 people that have been in charge. And again, if you have the, you can stomach all the detail. I think the first 60 pages or so of his book by Raymond Franz, Crisis of Conscience, it's the most devastating and detailed account of all the secret dealings of the governor, government, uh, governing body and if you have somebody that's right on the edge and, and he used to be in the Jehovah Witnesses and now he's kind of disillusioned, you should give him Raymond Franz's book because it, it just shows how terrible uh, and controlling the Jehovah Witnesses have been. And coming from a guy who was one of the original 144,000, you know. Every doctrinal, organizational, or practical directive issued by the governing body is completely binding upon all Jehovah Witnesses. This body is the main channel through which God speaks today according to them. So this body of men, they're all men, they, when they speak, it's as if God is speaking to us. That's what they think. The governing body maintains strict and total control over everything that involves the Jehovah Witnesses. And now they are the faithful and wise slave of Matthew 24. It used to be Charles Taze Russell. It used to be other people, Rutherford. But now it's us. And also, as uh, I know for years, for almost the whole history of the Jehovah Witnesses, their headquarters was in Brooklyn, New York. But now, because they have publishing houses all over the world, they're moving to Warwick, New York. And uh, they're building it right now. There's this massive facility that they're building out in the middle of a forest in Warwick, New York. And that's where all the governing body their headquarters is located. All right, let's stop right there. Does anybody have any questions?